as you know, are Near versus Minnesota, which uh, celebrated its 90th anniversary last week, commemorating it a week ago today, and the uh, Cohen versus Coles media case, which is coming up to its 30th anniversary at the end of the month. And I, uh, I'm taking this occasion to look back at both of those cases. Both arose in Minnesota. Both were landmark Supreme Court decisions. They were significant in their time. And uh, we're also going to take a look at what the implications are and how they are, um, how they've affected the current uh, state of the law as far as First Amendment law goes. Uh, we seem to be living these days in somewhat of a golden age of the First Amendment, although I don't think uh, we recognize it as such. Uh, by that, I'm referring to um, the recent rulings of the Supreme Court. And by recent, you can go back really almost a decade or more under John Roberts, during the John Roberts regime. And uh, it seems as though almost every First Amendment claim that has reached the Supreme Court, in which they've taken certiorari and ruled and made a decision, Almost every time, if you go back and look over the last 10 years or so, the First Amendment claimant, whether a plaintiff bringing a claim or a defendant defending against a claim based on First Amendment grounds, almost invariably the First Amendment claim has prevailed before the Roberts Court uh, in a number of different contexts, protests at funerals, uh, signage issues, limitations on um, access type issues, to uh, records. In almost all of those cases, not all, but almost all of them, the First Amendment claimant has prevailed. That's not surprising given what Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts has said about himself. Uh, two years ago this month, he was giving a commencement speech at a law school, and he remarked about himself that he was, quote, probably the most aggressive defender of the First Amendment in the, on the court. And um, it probably is borne out by not just his rulings, uh, but uh, the decisions of the court as a whole. Although some observers, including one notable uh, Supreme Court analyst on CNN, remarked that it was an observation that, that draws some skepticism, but is not far from the mark. And that probably is an accurate summation of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence on First Amendment free speech and freedom of expression issues these days. Let's see how it started. Well, we go back to the Near versus Minnesota case, which was the first significant landmark media First Amendment freedom of expression case. It all started right here in Minnesota, as we'll see on the next slide. Next one, please. Near versus Minnesota goes back really to the pre-1920s. In the late teens, uh, as, so as the progressive muckraking era came to an end, the progressive and muckrakers of the early part of the 20th century, they kind of faded out as World War I began and as, the progr as progressives began uh, attaining more political power and political offices, the, some of the progressive movement tended to fade away. They were, but in Minnesota, they were replaced by a somewhat of a, a, a quasi version of muckraking reporting. Newspapers arose in the Twin Cities and in Duluth that were known at the time as rags. One of them was the Saturday Press. That was a publication based in Minneapolis, but really covered the Twin Cities as a whole. There was a similar one up in Duluth called the Ripsaw. And what they did was a form of muckraking, but it might not have been recognized as such by the original muckrakers, who, as you know from history, were progressive, probably be called liberals of the 60s or 70s, who uh, tried to advance social issues on behalf of uh, underrepresented people, minorities, and um, other uh, causes that uh, were not hadn't hadn't been given much uh, uh, attention by. Uh, political leaders in the past. These muckrakers in these publications, though, took on, took on the establishment. So they had in common with the early progressive muckrakers taking on authority, taking on an establishment. The Saturday Press in particular launched a number of vehement uh, articles, so-called investigations, commentaries, opinion pieces, and the like directed at what it viewed as corruption and abuse by government officials, mainly local government officials in the city of Minneapolis and to some extent St. Paul, 
the police department, and uh, other authoritarian figures at the time. Um, and that was in the tradition of muckraking, progressive muckraking, but the Saturday press and its counterparts um, had, had another flavor to it. They were, they were characterized by what some would call virtu virulent anti-Semitism. They, uh, they were racist, they were anti-Catholic, and they were anti-labor. Uh, and those opinions seeped, not only seeped, but imbued the publications with a lot of commentary and opinions and uh, uh, diatribes against uh, Jews, against African Americans, uh, against uh, Catholics, and against people who are advancing the interests of working people. But they also, at the same time, took on the establishment and the authorities of the time and pointed out the corruption and abuse that they saw in local government, local law enforcement, and the like. So it was kind of a mixture of what, by modern times, we would call progressive or liberal positions and very conservative reactionary positions. Um, they, uh, they weren't, they, 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 as I said, they started in the 19 teens, 1916 actually was the birth of the Saturday press. But uh, during the World War I and the, uh, our involvement in World War I, they kind of subsided and they were not major factors, but they rose again to prominence in the 1920s. And um, it was their taking on of political authorities and political establishment figures that led to the famous Near versus Minnesota case. Now, I might say, I, I should say that much of what, uh, some of what the what was published in these new publications um, were valid and were accurate. And uh, although they were extreme and oftentimes over-exaggerated, they did point up some real serious cases of abuse, mal, uh, maladministration, wrongdoing in relatively high places, at least at local levels of government. So they weren't totally off the mark on that, but in their attacks, they were very virulent and um, personalized their attacks and made various accusations, some of which were accurate and some of which weren't, against local government officials and police officials and those kind of authorities. The Saturday Press was run by, the, the, the Saturday Press, which was the Twin Cities version of these rags, as they were called at the time, was run by Jay Near, a journalist, and his partner, Howard Guilfoyle, G-U-I-L-F-O-R-D. But Near is the one who gained fame, although both he, he had a partner named Guilford who also participated in the publication with him. In, uh, the, the, they called their newspaper ultra-intellectual, but as I said, it was really quite racist, quite anti-labor, heavily anti-Semitic, notwithstanding its, uh, some of its valid and accurate attacks on government wrongdoing. The, um, the rise of these publications led to the enactment in Minnesota in 1927 of what was called a public nuisance law, statewide statute. The statute was directed toward these publications, although they were named as such, that might be a violation of, a bill of a the Bill of Attainder provision of the Constitution, but they allowed the uh, courts, they gave the authority to judges to permanently close or enjoin, shut down publications that were deemed in the words of the statute to be, quote, malicious, scandalous, and defamatory. So the law empowered public officials to seek injunctions against newspapers or other publications that they deemed to be malicious, scandalous, or defamatory. And that was known as the Minnesota Public Nuisance Law. And it was unique to Minnesota, as we'll see in a few moments. This was not the kind of, this was not a, a model after other laws in other jurisdictions. It was, and it wasn't picked up as a model for other jurisdictions. It did not become a template. It was unique to the island of Minnesota, as we'll see in the next slide. The lawsuit against the publication under the public nuisance statute was commenced in Hennepin County District Court by Floyd B. Olson. Olson was at the time the Hennepin County attorney. He was born and raised in North Minneapolis, grew up here, attended law school here, and became the Hennepin County attorney. 
Olson was Scandinavian, but he grew up in a largely a predominantly Jewish neighborhood of North Minneapolis. And he was well regarded uh, by the Jewish community. And he had many friends, supporters, patrons, and backers who were Jewish, among other, among other supporters of his. So he had, so he had a particular uh, feel and flair for some of the anti-Semitism that was imbued in the Saturday Press and other publications of, it of its time. He brought an action to enjoin the publication, and this was, by enjoining, he meant shut them down, lock them up, shut her down, not, not lock them up criminally, but lock up the, the press and shut down the newspaper permanently. And he prevailed before the Hennepin County District Court. The case was then against, and he brought the case only against the Saturday Press itself. The case was then appealed to the Minnesota Supreme Court. This was long before, of course, we had the Court of Appeals. It went direct to the Supreme Court. And the Minnesota Supreme Court in 1928, the lawsuit began in 1927. It reached the Supreme Court in 1928. They upheld the validity of the public nuisance law and the court's injunction shutting down the Mears newspaper on grounds that it was that the paper was quote detrimental to public morales and the general welfare that's the wording of the supreme court state supreme court decision and there it seemed to rest after the supreme court upheld the lower court ruling the case was just about to wither out and so was near in its publication for that matter until at the last moment the they, they received a twenty five thousand dollar fund funding from the publisher of the Chicago Tribune, Colonel Robert McCormick. The Chicago Tribune at the time, and for many years before and thereafter, was one of the country's major newspapers and major organs. It was uh, the communications organs. It was known as the, the world's greatest newspaper, it called itself, WGN. In fact, that was the call letters for the radio station WGN and the television station WGN, which uh, was one of the early uh, television stations that were shown nationwide on cable television and still is around for WGN. The Tribune owned a number of newspapers. McCormick was one of those colorful publishers of its era. He was sort of like a William Randolph Hearst type and a Joseph Pulitzer type, but he was after their era. They were, of course, in the late 19th century, but he was, uh, he was very um, politically oriented and opinionated and very, very conservative. And that Chicago Tribune took on that uh, view for many, many years and, uh, until at least the 60s or 70s, there was a bastion of, con of, of conservatism, sometimes extreme conservatism. It later uh, tempered that down and uh, became less, uh, less outspoken on conservative causes. And just recently, it was just uh, part of a package that was sold through a bankruptcy proceeding to uh, some other entity. But the Chicago Tribune still survives. But in its day, it was one of the major newspapers in the country in a time when newspapers were significant and important communications vehicles, much more so than they are now. There was no radio at that time as a practical matter, just starting, no television, of course, uh, and uh, no internet and, and anything of that nature. So newspapers were very significant. McCormick donated $25,000 to take the case to the Supreme Court. Ordinarily, one would say, well, why would McCormick be involved with these fellows who were muckrakers and somewhat liberal and somewhat anti-authoritarian and certainly outsiders. They were not in the mainstream at all of the, of the public uh, communications mode. But McCormick saw, saw the law itself, the public nuisance law, as being anathema to the First Amendment. He referred to it as tyrannical and un-American. So he sponsored the case and got it to the Supreme Court, which we'll see in the next slide. Well, it happened when I got there. So the case gets to the Supreme Court. It was uh, the Supreme Court took the case on certiorari. It did have discretion to not to take the case, just like it does these days. It wasn't a, you know it wasn't mandatory jurisdiction back then, but the Supreme Court did take the case. They heard the case in January of 1931, and they issued it, the court issued its ruling on June 1st, 1931, 90 years ago this week. Just about all of us know what the ruling was, and if we don't, we'll find out in a minute. But it's not only lawyers who know about the ruling, it's just generally it's a part of American history and lore that, that most people recognize, if not by name, at least the premise of the case. 
but there's some interesting features of the case that uh, perhaps are not as well known. Uh, the holding in the near case was that the Minnesota public nuisance law was unconstitutional, a violation of the First Amendment right of freedom of, of, of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of press. That was the holding in the case. How it got there is significant and important. For one thing, the ruling was a five to four decision. So if one vote had flipped, it would have come out the other way. And we think of Near versus Minnesota standing for the importance of the First Amendment, and it's the primacy of freedom of expression and the prohibition of what the court referred to as previous restraint. We call it prior restraint. The court's language was that it was unconstitutional to engage in, the law was unconstitutional because it imposed, quote, previous restraint. We call that prior restraint upon publication. But it was a narrow decision, five to four. The decision was written by Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes. Hughes himself was one of the interesting characters in this uh, whole drama, along with Neer and others. But Hughes had been the governor of New York in the early part of the century. He also had run for, he had also been on the Supreme Court in the early part of the century. He left the Supreme Court in 1960, he left the Supreme Court in 1916. Coincidentally, that was the time that the Saturday Press began publishing. Those two weren't related necessarily. But Hughes ran for president in 1916 on the Republican ticket against the incumbent Woodrow Wilson. And Hughes almost won that election. It was a very close election. And Wilson, uh, when the evening ended uh, that night, and they were able to count the ballots pretty quickly those days, uh, Wilson seemed to have lost. He went to sleep that night being consoled by his supporters uh, that he had lost. He was told by his supporters that he had lost, and um, he didn't because late returns came in from California. California was at that time didn't have a lot of electoral votes, but it had enough to swing the election. And it was sort of like the Bush-Gore election of 2020 in which one state kind of held the key to victory or defeat. And when the California vote came in, and it came in kind of slowly, not only because California is a long way away, although they had communications, obviously, by, by, by telegraph and wire service, but a lot of the California, California was still a pretty rural state, and a lot of the vote was upstate in the mining area and in the forestry area and outstate in the rural valley areas. And it took a while to get those votes in, and they came in late, although by the next morning, the California vote had come in, and Wilson won. Hughes lost. So that was Charles Evans Hughes. He returned, however, to the Supreme Court in the 1920s. He was appointed to replace Chief Justice Howard, William Howard Taft, who had been president in the early part of the century. But after, ha after Taft died, Hughes was appointed as Chief Justice. So Hughes was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He wrote the majority decision. One hurdle that Neer had to overcome in his case was whether the First Amendment even applies to this statute. For many, many years, it had been assumed that the, the First Amendment and all of the Bill of Rights, for that matter, only restrained the federal government. Congress shall make no law. That's what the First Amendment said. And the First Amendment and other provisions of the federal Bill of Rights had rarely, if ever, been applied to state or local government conduct or action or legislation. And the general presumption was that the Bill of Rights, including the First Amendment, does not apply, it only applies to congressional or federal government action. That principle was enhanced in a Minnesota case in 1916. That was the same year that Hughes ran for president. That was the same year the Saturday Press began, 1916. The case was Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad Company versus Bombolas, 1916 Supreme Court case. The issue in that case was whether the federal right to a jury trial under the Seventh Amendment applies to state court actions under the Federal Employer Liability Act. That was an act. That was a law that was adopted, enacted in the early uh, 1900s. That was essentially a workers' compensation law for injured railroad employees. Uh, 
under the FELA, uh, an injured employee could bring a, an action either in state court or federal court. And that's the way it still is today, I think. At any rate, an injured railroad employee sued for an in, uh, under the FELA in state court, and he sought a jury, but the state court did not allow him a jury trial, so he claimed that he had a right to a jury trial under the Seventh Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which provides for jury trials in civil cases. That was the issue in the Bombolas case. The Supreme Court rejected unanimously that proposition. And the Supreme Court decision in the Bombolas case stated that it was, quote, beyond cavil, C-A-V-I-L, beyond cavil, without with no dispute that the First Amendment, that the Bill of Rights only applies to federal action, not state action. And that was the prevailing thought of the day that any claims under the Constitution do not, the, any federal, any Bill of Rights claims under the Constitution do not apply to, the state, to statu state statutes as a result of the, as in the Bombolas case. That position uh, receded in the post-World War I cases in which a number of individuals were tried for violating federal and state sedition laws for advocacy against uh, participation in World War I or advocacy against enlisting in the uh, military during World War I. And there were a number of cases in the 1920s that addressed whether the sedition laws that prohibited people from speaking out against war or the war during that World War I period were constitutional. Some were federal, some were state. One of the notable cases that reached the Supreme Court was Gilbert versus Minnesota. That was a challenge to the Minnesota sedition law, which prohibited uh, advocacy against the war. Um, and uh, there were a number of other cases in that era. That was the era, incidentally, that coined that Oliver Wendell Holmes coined the famous phrase, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. That was part of those World War I cases. But what was interesting for our purposes in those World War I cases is that the Supreme Court applied the First Amendment right of freedom of speech in, or uh, considered those, uh, the right of freedom of speech in those cases. It rejected the First Amendment claims uh, in those cases, some of which were state cases like Gilbert. While it rejected the, the, the arguments against those laws, again, under the theory of you can't shout fire in a crowd, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater, nevertheless, the court seemed to recognize implicitly that the First Amendment can be applied or been, can be considered in challenges to state statutes. A reversal not an, not an explicit reversal, but a change from the attitude in the Bambolas case, which said the First Amendment, uh, that, that, that Bill of Rights don't apply to state action. So that's the, the posture of that, the, uh, that's the, that was the status of uh, First Amendment and Bill of Rights litigation at the time of Near. So Near had to, first of all, convince the court to apply the First Amendment to the Minnesota statute. The Bombolas case suggested it couldn't. The World War I cases suggested it could, but there was no definitive ruling until near. And Chief Justice Hughes, in the near decision, stated that it was beyond dispute, beyond dispute, that the First Amendment applied to state statutes. Well, there may be some people who disputed it because the court had never said that before. And while he was somewhat insouciant about it, the case law, the, the authorities and case law before him did not necessarily support that position, a matter that the defend, the dissent noted. At any rate, Neer managed to hurt, get over the, that hurdle, and therefore his case could be addressed, his, his argument could be addressed under the First Amendment. Well, what was his argument? Well, his argument was that the Minnesota statute impairs and transgresses the right of freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of press, because it imposes this kind of gag, this san this uh, prohibition on speaking, uh, regardless of uh, any kind of actual harm. And moreover, it imposes a license. It's essentially a licensure statute. It, it, it empowers the authorities to close down a publication in perpetuity because of claims that the publication was uh, saying things or writing things that 
people found offensive. And Hughes pointed out that the law did not deal with post-publication sanctions. And the decision was very clear that we're not saying here that you can't impose sanctions for libel or other matters after publication, but you can't stop a publication from publishing or you can't stop someone from speaking in the future simply because of alleged past improprieties or offensive uh, or offensive public uh, offensive expression and that was the claim that near made that was the claim that was rejected in the lower courts but that was the claim that hughes adopted for the supreme court in the case the decision um, most uh, a large part of the decision traced the development of the first amendment from anglo-saxon law and goes back many many years in the medieval days and thereafter in the development of the concept of uh, freedom of expression and the prohibition in even in early English law of any kind of previous or prior restraint, which Hughes felt was uh, embedded in the First Amendment concept of freedom of expression. So Hughes's decision, therefore, stood for the proposition that a, uh, a publication, and for that matter, a speech in general, cannot be restrained it can be punished, but it can't be stopped because the authorities deem it improper or inappropriate. Um, the decision, the application of that ruling came through the 14th Amendment. Hughes said that the First Amendment pro protection of freedom of expression applies to the states through the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, a matter that he said was no longer open to doubt, even though there had been doubt before. That doctrine we know today is selective incorporation, although it's not very selective these days. These days, just about every provision in the Bill of Rights has been applied to state action. Not all of them. There's a couple of slight exceptions. But over time, the courts, the Supreme Court in the lead, have applied most of the provisions of the Bill of Rights jury trial rights, search and seizure rights, search, reasonable searches, uh, and the like. Almost all of the provisions of the Bill of Rights, right to counsel, all of them have been applied to the states through the 14th Amendment. That started with the Near case. It was sanctified seven years later in United States versus Caroline Products. In that case, um, which was a, in that case, the Supreme Court dropped in a footnote, it's known as famous footnote number four. This is seven years after near in the in the Caroline Products case, the Supreme Court in a footnote mentioned, oh yeah, by the way, there's nobody who questions, and there's no doubt that the, bill, the provisions of the Constitution apply to state laws. That again was only in a footnote and was never expressly decided by the court in, 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 other than that footnote, but that became the basis for the doctrine of selective incorporation, which subsequent case law used to apply almost all of the Bill of Rights provisions to the state, to state action, state statutes, and local government as well. And that stems from uh, Chief Justice Hughes's remark in Near, and it's no longer open to doubt that the First Amendment does apply to um, state action. Justice, uh, Chief Justice Hughes's decision also pointed out that the Minnesota statute was, in his words, quote, unusual if not unique. And he was right about the former and right on the latter. As I mentioned, there were no other state laws that were similar to the Minnesota law at the time and haven't been, well, they have been since then, but at the time it was, uh, it was uh, one of its kind that was struck down. Hughes men stated that the case raised questions of grave importance transcending the local interests involved in this particular action and said that this is a, as a matter of constitutional law, the press cannot be restrained or prohibited from publishing material. They can be punished for perhaps for what they do publish, but they can't be prohibited from publishing it just because it offends people. The, um, there are four dissents and four dissenters, one dissent, but four dissenters. And as I said, the decision was a five to four decision. And the dissent was written by Pierce Butler. Pierce Butler was the first justice on the Minnesota of the on the United States Supreme Court from Minnesota. And Butler is one of four 
uh, justices on the court during that era, the 20s and well into the 1930s, who were known as the Four Horsemen. And they almost always voted together in a very, what would be called conservative way. As you recall from your history later on, in, the, in some of the New Deal legislation, the uh, Franklin Roosevelt New Deal legislation, some of that was stricken by the Supreme Court and in the lead on striking down some of the New Deal legislation was the four horsemen, these four conservatives, but they weren't able to muster a fifth vote in the near case. The four dissenters under the joining the decision written by Pierce Butler would have upheld the public nuisance law, the Minnesota law, would have voted against near and allowed the, the, the state to shut near's paper down on grounds that it was an exercise of police powers. And the dissenters would have upheld the Minnesota law because uh, the publication, Near's publication, quote, expose, exposes the public, ex, I'm sorry, exposes and underlie, undermine, and it should be exposes and undermines the peace and good order of the communities. So they viewed it as a sort of a police powers, kind of public health and welfare, as did the Minnesota Supreme Court. But that didn't carry the day, as we'll see in the next slide. And Near prevailed in his case, establishing the principle of against prior restraint of the press. Well, what happened to Near in the publication afterwards? Well, the press continued to publish. It had been shut down for about four years during the course of the litigation. But after the Supreme Court decision, Near and his colleagues were back again publishing the same publication. Although it was much more subdued, times had changed. Now it was the Depression era, and it was somewhat less virulent in terms of being anti-labor, being ra less racist, less anti-Semitic, and more focused on economic concerns rather than social issues that permeated the paper in the 1920s. And it was more a um, it was more a beacon for calling for economic equality uh, in a much more subdued fashion than it had been earlier. It also acquired a new motto. Rather than calling itself an ultra intellectual paper, it now used the Supreme Court decision as its motto. In a sense, its new motto was quote the paper that refused to be gagged. And it went on that way for a few years. One of Near's colleagues. Howard Guilford um, was running the paper largely at that time. Near was a, a secondary kind of contributing editor, but it was run by Guilford, who had an interesting background as well, another one of the interesting cast of characters in the whole drama. Guilford had had a somewhat checkered history, had some alleged ties with organized crime. It wasn't called organized crime at the time. It was called gangsters and mobsters, and he was shot and managed to survive a shooting in during the 1920s because of uh, results uh, attributable to his publication, his work on the newspaper. But he wasn't so lucky the second time. In 1934, he was shot in the streets of Minneapolis and killed. He was in his car at the time, but he was uh, ambushed. The, no one was ever charged with the, either of those offenses, including his death, although it was believed that he was shot by what were referred to as the Chicago mobsters. Uh, trying to get even with him for some offense. So after Guilford was shot and killed in 1934, Near was quite subdued anyway, and he dropped out of the newspaper, and the newspaper closed, and Near then died in obscurity a few years later. Um, and uh, as far as uh, uh, Floyd B. Olson, who brought the lawsuit, he ultimately became the governor of Minnesota during the Depression years, and he was he was a progressive liberal governor and he was considered among others as being a possible presidential candidate in 1936 if roosevelt didn't run again he was kind of the progressive wing of the democratic party at the time in the progressive wing of the democratic party and there were a number of people who uh, there are a number of different factions that thought that maybe Roosevelt wouldn't run again in 36 or could be defeated in 36 within his own party. And they included Huey Long of Louisiana and Floyd Olson. They were different, different, well, different extreme factions of the Democratic Party. But but Olson was considered a possible presidential candidate in 1936. And if not in 1936, 
he was considered a potential contender in 1940 when, of course, Roosevelt would have been term limited, right? Well, not really, but uh, but people at that time, it was a two term limit was believed to be inherent in the presidency. And it was thought that uh, Olson might be a candidate for president in 1940. Alas, that wasn't to be either. He died of cancer as a young man, relatively young. He was in his 40s. He died of cancer in 1935. And um, uh, his namesake highway a uh, namesake highway is named after him and that's a view of it highway 55 which runs from uh well runs a long way from the western part of the twin city suburbs all the way down to hastings i think and beyond uh, highway 55 is known as the floyd b memorial olson highway and that's a view of it coming in from north minneapolis where um, he grew up into downtown there used to be a statue of olson on uh right on uh right off of the highway there in the north side of Minneapolis. I don't know where that is. I looked for it the other day and couldn't find it. I guess they moved it. But uh, Highway 55 is a fi known as Floyd B. Memorial Olson Highway, named after the Hennepin County attorney at the time who prosecuted the near case. By prosecute, I meant civil action. It was not a criminal action. Next slide, please. So that's the end of near, and that's the end of the Saturday press. The principle established was the principle against prior or previous restraint. Uh, we'll see how that comes up a little bit later when we talk about implications. This also is the 30th anniversary of another landmark Minnesota First Amendment case. That's the Cohen versus Coles Media case. Uh, and it came through the, it was decided by the Supreme Court on June 24th, 1991, uh, 30 years ago this month. That case is probably a little bit more, for, some of the facts in that case are probably a little bit more familiar to most people because many of us live through it and remember it. Uh, it goes back to the early 1980s, 19, uh, the gubernatorial election of 1982. Rudy Perpich was seeking to make a comeback. He had been governor for a couple of years in the late 70s after Wendell Anderson appointed himself to the, uh, had Perpich appoint him to the uh, Senate. Perpich uh, lost in 78. He was coming back running again in 1982. Uh, the incumbent governor, Al Qui, was not running for re-election, so it was an open seat. Perpich was running, and his lieutenant governor candidate was a woman, Marlene Johnson. Uh, these days, it's pretty common, uh, not just in Minnesota, but around the country, to see uh, split gender tickets. Uh, usually a man running as the governor and a woman as lieutenant governor, sometimes the other way around. But I believe that Marlene Johnson was the first uh, major party candidate for lieutenant governor who was a woman. Uh, there had been a couple of other women governors, but I think she was probably one of the very first women who was put on a ticket to sort of gender balance the ticket. Uh, at any rate, right before the election, a few days before the election, a uh, a uh, individual, Dan Cohen was the individual, who had been active in, in, in Republican politics. He had been a city council member in, Minis in Minneapolis and was a, a Republican activist of sorts, uh, leaked to two newspaper reporters, one for the Star Tribune and one for the Pioneer Press, that Marlene Johnson had a record uh, of having some very minor uh, offenses. Uh, they were largely were shoplift, small shoplifting offenses for which she had pled guilty. They were either petty misdemeanors or misdemeanors. I guess they were misdemeanors, but they were minor offenses. He leaked that, if you will, to two of the reporters for the newspapers, um, but he required them to promise that they would maintain his confidentiality. He wanted to be an anonymous or confidential news source. And the two reporters said, yes, we'll take that information and we will not publish your name. We will pro they promised him confidentiality. However, when they got back to their newsrooms, uh, the editors in both papers overrode that and said, no, we have to publish it. And the story didn't become Marlene Johnson had a couple of minor of, of offenses in her record. The story became this Republican operative was trying to smear her and trying to remain confidential. So Cohen became the story. And it was on the front page of both newspapers for a couple of days within, within days of the election. But the story barely talked about Marlene Johnson. The focus of the story was, look what this uh, individual is trying to do to smear Marlene Johnson. And he was named as the source. He then sued both newspapers and he uh, claiming breach of contract and misrepresentation. 
he claimed that he had a contract or agreement with the reporters not to publish his name. And the newspapers breached that contract or agreement, and there was no written agreement. It was an oral agreement. Uh, but he claimed that the newspapers breached that agreement and that they also engaged in fraud and misrepresentation by the, the reporters did by re representing him that they keep his name confidential and they didn't do that. So that's misrepresentation. There was no dispute by the newspapers that there was a agreement to keep it confidential. The newspapers in defending the case did not allege that there was no, con no agreement or contract. They alleged a First Amendment defense that they were entitled to publish that information under the First Amendment and any um, judicially imposed sanction of that, such as a jury verdict against them, would violate the First Amendment, that they were protected in making that publication, notwithstanding the fact that they promised they wouldn't name the name of the source. Well, the Hennepin County District Court jury didn't, didn't disagree with the newspaper. They agree with Cohen, who brought the case, and they awarded 700,000 of damages. Um, there was $200,000 of compensatory damages and $500,000 in punitive damages. And we'll see what happened to that in the next slide. That case took, next slide please, that case went through the Minnesota judicial system for almost about a decade. Uh, the um, matter was appealed to the Minnesota Court of Appeals in 1989. It was partially affirmed, partially reversed. The, uh, the, the, the affirmance was of the $200,000 damage award uh, for but uh, for breach of contract or breach of agreement, the five hundred thousand dollars of punitive damages and fraud was thrown out, and the, the, at the court of appeals level, and the Supreme Court uh, affirmed and upheld the two hundred thousand dollar award. So the Supreme Court decision, Minnesota Supreme Court decision, was that the two hundred thousand dollar award could be intact for breach of contract. That was then appealed to the uh, uh, Supreme Court. United States Supreme Court and uh, another five to four decision. Uh, but this time the press lost the case. The argument made by the newspapers was that the First Amendment prohibits imposing a fine. This wasn't a civil, this wasn't a civil fine. It wasn't a criminal fine, but it was essentially a judicial fine imposed by a jury, a civil fine, civil damages, but it was the imposition by a jury of awarding money to a person who claimed that his uh, reputation, not his reputation, but claimed that his contract, his, his contract had been breached and, his, and he's entitled to damages for that breach of contract. So the newspapers defended on the uh, First Amendment grounds. The claimant in the case, Cohen, asserted that the newspaper should not be given any kind of special exemption or exclusion from the breach of the law of contract. Cohen's argument was this is simply a tort claim. It's a state tort claim. This isn't like near with a government imposing a shutdown of a newspaper. No one's restraining the newspapers from saying anything. This is just a, if you will, a standard breach of contract tort claim under state law. And the, news, the newspapers and the press in general do not have any kind of exemption or exclusion from being subject to the same breach of contract laws that govern everybody else. The Supreme Court agreed with that, as did the Minnesota Supreme Court. The Minnesota Supreme Court upheld the portion of damages and on breach of contract claim. Actually, they called it, the Supreme Court called it promissory estoppel. They, they referred to it as a promissory estoppel claim. But the Supreme Court, Minnesota Supreme Court, said that the, the upholding the damages were allowable because uh, breach of contract is a general law that does not single out the press. It, a, a breach of contract applies to everybody, all institutions, and the press doesn't get a special free pass on that. The Supreme, the United States Supreme Court, in its decision, ruled likewise, that the press does not have any special First Amendment immunity from laws of general applicability. Since contract law applies to all entities, all individuals, all businesses, it's not, it's not, it doesn't single out the press, it is a valid measure of this individual's damages. So the Supreme Court upheld that decision and sent it back to the Supreme Court and remanded it for further consideration, which we'll see in the next slide. Oh, at the, I'm sorry, at the Supreme Court level, I should mention that while, while the majority upheld the law of being of general applicability, trumping the First Amendment, there was four dissenters 
and one of the dissent, one of the dissent, dissenting decisions was written by Justice Blackmun, misspelled, Justice Harry Blackmun, B-L-A-C-K-M-U-N, my fault, uh, from Minnesota, of course. Blackmun's dissent said that the press should not be penalized for reporting truthful information regarding a political campaign. So the dissenter saw this as being, as long, because the publication was truthful, they did truthfully identify who the anonymous source was, a confidential source, and in light of the nature of the, of, of the subject matter, this concerned a po political campaign, which obviously is uh, central to the First Amendment, uh, that the, the, the press should be able to publish truthful information, regardless of how it got it or what it did wrongfully to uh, obtain that information. But that decision was the dissenters. The majority was that the uh, lower court ruling was proper. Case was remanded back to the Minnesota Supreme Court. A year later, the Supreme Court upheld the $200,000 uh, decision. It did not send the matter back to the lower courts. It went back to the Supreme Court. There were no further proceedings below. And the Supreme Court reconsidered its prior decision and upheld the, the prior decision on promissory estoppel ground. The Supreme Court decision, the United States Supreme Court decision, uh, was sandwiched between the two Supreme, Minnesota Supreme Court decisions upholding the $200,000 award on promissory estoppel ground. What happened after, and it was a, that was a 10 year battle and it finally came to an end. Uh, the award of $200,000, I might add, was a significantly enhanced by the interest that had been accumulated over those 10 years of litigation. And back in those days, the interest rate was a lot higher than it is now. So I think the ultimate amount of the award more than doubled at $200,000. The upshot uh, was that Perpich did win that election rather resoundingly, and he served that term, 82 to 86, and then ran again in 86 and won again. And uh, so he served uh, 10 years as governor. I think he was the longer serving governor of state. He ultimately ran again for a reelection in 1990 and lost, but he and Marlene Johnson did serve those eight years, two terms. Another upshot of that case was, at least at the time, it, it was a major turning point for a short period of time in journalistic codes and ethics. And the media in general became much more introspective about how it covered news there was, uh, and came up with some internal codes and guidelines about the use of confidential sources, when they should be used, when they shouldn't be used, what kind of approval must be given to use confidential sources. There are also was some cutbacks and limitations on uh, ambush journalism, secret film, camera work, uh, taping or filming people in secret by media and using that in investigative reports. Those kind of uh, matters that were deemed to be invasive of privacy became much more um, restricted and restrained by the media for some period of time. But it was a relatively short period of time, and it wasn't too long before the media was still using, back to using uh, confidential sources and hidden cameras and the like, and is doing it on a relatively widespread basis these days. In fact, just uh, the other day, in, in the Sunday edition of the New York Times, um, I, I counted I, I counted just in the general news section, there were seven references to a confidential source, a highly placed member of the administration, a, a, a person who was close to the, uh, to the uh, Trump campaign, a uh, spokesperson for the White House who would refuse to be identified. So, uh, the use of confidential sources probably is, is still going pretty strong. And uh, next slide, please. Um, and, uh, and oops, let's go back to the previous slide. I'm sorry. Previous slide. I don't want to give away next, next year. Yeah. So confidential sources are being used, I think, with increasing frequency these days. Uh, but probably, and there was, a, there was a spate of these lawsuits, these confidential news source outings, outing cases back shortly after Cohen. I haven't seen one lately. But uh, there was a period of time when a number of cases were brought by sources who were outed. Uh, but I think the media is being more careful about how they promise confidentiality, when they promise confidentiality, and, uh, and uh, very rarely out confidential sources. In some cases, these lawsuits are versions of Cohen when someone says, well, my name wasn't published, but I was identified in a way that people would recognize me. And those are kind of offshoots of the Cohen case. So Cohen has had its impact. Of course, back to the Near case, Near has had a major impact on litigation over the, on, on the law over the years, not just in prior restraint cases, but in enhancing First Amendment protection and freedom of expression generally. Of course, the most important case that followed on the heels 
of the New York case, although it wasn't real shortly after, it was a long time afterwards, was the Pentagon Papers case in the early 1970s when the New York Times and then the Washington Post published the uh, secret government uh, papers, uh, papers uh, describing the, uh, the United States' involvement and role in the, in, in the Vietnam War and some of the deceptions and misleading information that was given out to the public. They were published by the New York Times. The Nixon administration, which was not had not developed the Pentagon Papers, they were part of the Johnson administration, the Kennedy administration, but the Nixon administration sought to to uh, enjoin the Times and the Post from publishing those Pentagon Papers, and ultimately that case reached the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that the uh, threw out a lower court injunction and ruled that the uh, papers could publish that information. Uh, even though there were national security concerns and even though there were claims that the information was wrongfully obtained, the court relied upon Near versus Minnesota in saying that the, that, the, that the judiciary does not have the right or the authority to restrain or prohibit publication in a, or engage in any prior restraint because of Near versus Minnesota. So the Pentagon Papers were published. The, the, the Nixon administration did bring criminal action against the people who, who purloined the Pentagon Papers and gave them to the, the, the Times and the Washington Post. That was Daniel Ellsberg and one of his confederates, and they were prosecuted criminally by the Nixon administration for violating various uh, uh, national security uh, laws. And that criminal prosecution piffled out by, as a mistrial because this was uh, right during Watergate, one of uh, Nixon's uh, aides, John Ehrlichman, one of the Watergate people, uh, one of the people who was caught up in the Watergate offenses, John Ehrlichman had approached the judge who was hearing the Ellsberg criminal case uh, with a, a not so subtle offer of a higher position, a higher judicial position. Um, and once that was revealed, the uh, basic, that led to a mistrial in the criminal case involving the Pentagon Papers, the Ellsberg case, and the government didn't prosecute those individuals. So the uh, New York Times, the near cases uh, had significant uh, impact on the law. It still does. And I think to a significant extent, it's still there underlying what Chief Justice Roberts said about himself and the court, that at this stage, that uh, they are probably the most aggressive defenders of the First Amendment in many years. And they might be right. And if so, they trace that lineage back to the Near versus Minnesota case 90 years ago. And to some extent, some of those issues were addressed, although resolved in a different way in the Cohen versus uh, Cole's media case 30 years ago. So that's uh, where I'll wrap it up. I'll be glad to take some questions, comments, or minimal criticism if you have any. And uh, as we go to the next slide, what do we have? Speaking of anniversaries, what do we have next year? Oh, no. Next year is the 30th anniversary of another famous Minnesota Supreme Court case, which also made its way into uh, literature, R.A.V. versus City of St. Paul. And that's another landmark First Amendment freedom of speech case from Minnesota, decided June 22, 1992. So perhaps we'll have another, uh, 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 maybe we should reconnoiter uh, next June and review the 30-year anniversary of RAV versus St. Paul. And perhaps we can prevail on a denizen of this building, Judge uh, Cleary, to talk about his role in the case because he represented the claimant in the RAV case. And as you can see, he wrote a, a wonderful book about it called Beyond the Burning Cross. So put that on your calendar, everyone. Maybe we should get back again next June to talk about the 30th anniversary of RAV versus City of St. Paul. Any comments, questions, commentary? Thank you very much for the opportunity to make this presentation. Hey, Marshall, I have a question for you. Sure. Have you been following the St. Cloud Daily Times case um, that uh, I think Dorsey's representing the Times on uh, about fair reporting and all that? Yeah, I think it's been settled. Did it completely settle now? I think it's been resolved to the satisfaction of the parties. Okay. I recently uh, became aware of uh, the House uh, Un-American uh, Affairs Committee proceedings. And I noticed that a lot of the screenwriters in Hollywood, instead of pleading the Fifth Amendment because they didn't believe they had committed a crime when they refused to answer questions, they used the First Amendment, thinking that that congressional committee 
was infringing on their right of free speech. Do you have any comments on that at all? You're talking about the old McCarthy days hearing? And the, on, no, but on, this isn't McCarthy. It's actually the other committee. Hugh yeah, Hugh House on Affair, on American Activities Committee, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I know. In the in the McCarthy type hearings, there were Fifth Amendment claims made, uh, you know, but uh, First Amendment claims were made. In the, yeah, there were there were some issues. Uh, the some of the people who were summoned to a answer questions about their involvement in uh, allegedly improper activities, uh, socialistic or con well, not social, communistic activities or left wing activities, refused to answer on First Amendment grounds. Incidentally, it's interesting that that term, the House Un-American Activities Committee, which was a big player back in the 50s and 60s um, in so-called in investigating so-called uh, uh, wrongdoing uh, by left-wing groups, uh, including civil rights groups as well, um, that uh, term, Un-American Activities, I think was coined to some extent in the Near case because, as I mentioned, Colonel McCormick, who financed the near appeal to the Supreme Court, referred to the Minnesota statute as being, quote, un-American. That's probably not the first time that term was used, but I think that term then got into the political lexicon for uh, because of the near case. How's that for tying threads together? Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you for your, your remark, your comments, Brett. Any other comments or questions? We did have one from the chat yeah. um, from Gary Gilson, which says, uh, when Geneva Overholzer, former editor of the Des Moines Register, became ombudsman of the Washington Post, she said her first goal was to reduce the widespread abuse of confidential sources she observed in the paper. When she left that job, she said that despite all her efforts, the abuses were worse. Well, yeah. Um, thank you, Gary. For those of you who aren't familiar with Gary, most of you are. I urge you to read his column every other Sunday in the Star Tribune business section. I don't remember what the title is, but it's about good writing style and techniques. And there's no one who knows it better than Gary Gilson. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's pervasive, the use of confidential sources, uh, these days, not just not just in, in political reporting, um, uh, leading up to the recent NFL football draft, there were some reports. Well, according to uh, reliable sources in the Viking camp, they're thinking of drafting this player or that player, but they won't name the you know they don't name the person who gave out that information. Sometimes the the, the worst, the, the most heinous, I think, use of that in the Times is is. Uh, deserves an award, a, a Razzie award for this, but the Times will sometimes will say, according to a source who refused to be identified because he's because he, he was not authorized to speak for. <laughs> and why are you using him to speak for? And that happens a lot in political reporting when they'll say, so we, have a, 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 we have information from someone who's not authorized to give us that information and, and is also not authorized to, we can't tell you who it is. But I think, as I said, if you want to engage in some kind of exercise, if you, if you instead of playing the crossword puzzle, because that's what I do, I don't, I don't crossword puzzles. But the New York Times, I go through there almost eh, not often, but once in a while, I'll just circle all the times they use confidential sources. And I said last Sunday it happened to be seven. That was a slow news day. And of course, when the Times does it or the Post does it, they're you know they're beacons for the rest of journalism. They kind of set the standard to some extent, or the guidelines for the journalistic community. Not alone, but if they're doing it, if the Times is doing it, everybody else can do it too, supposedly. Here's another question from Lee McGrath to everybody. Uh oh, there's a growing awareness of the power of big tech to censor social. Yeah, well, big tech presents all kinds of other issues too, and First Amendment issues, of, you know, of significance here. Um, I don't know. If, yeah, that's. I mean, it's it's worth looking at. Uh, you know, the the Saturday Press and the rags and the publications of the '30s. Or even the daily newspapers of you know of the Cohen era, you know, they are obviously much less important players these days than they were in the past. And the, the big tech and the, you know the social media are you know taking the place of those uh, institutions. And uh, they may call for, or they are calling for different restrictions and uh, and sanctions, or you know, at least uh, different uh, limitations on their authority and power. And uh, undoubtedly, if those, if and when some of those measures are passed, we're probably going to see First Amendment litigation. Uh, uh, the modern-day version of Near versus Minnesota and Cohen versus Coles Media will be with big tech and social media. Uh, 
Anything else? If not, I just want to say a big thank you to Marshall Tannock for today. Uh, yet another wonderful CLE from you. We appreciate it. And participants, we will be posting the, the not the video, but the recording of uh, the CLE. It will have video. It'll have the slides with it and the um, audio recording as well on our website, hopefully later today, if not tomorrow. And uh, CLE credit information is available on our website.